abiding. Amen. So, so we've been in what we've called the eternal series called Pioneer Path for we've lost track of how many months. Um, but we've actually moved on. So we're now in a new series called Abiding and for at least the month of September. And we've learned to not put a uh, deadline or a period on things because they just unfold as we follow the Holy Spirit. So P Pastor Perry Ann started last week with talking about the logos of the Word of God as a mirror to us and beginning to abide in the presence of God through His Word. We want to dive a little deeper over the next few weeks. Um, some of you may have remembered last week we made this announcement, and I'm just going to remind you of it in spite of, in spite of us. Last week, uh, we made the announcement that we would be out of town this week, and, and Pastor Tabitha Denny was going to be ministering this week, and Cliff Weaver next week. We've changed that up some because we stayed in town this week, so I'm not Pastor Tab. I'm sorry. You just have to look at me. And... Um, she is going to be ministering in two weeks, so Cliff is going to be ministering next Sunday, and then Tabitha is going to be ministering the 26th of September, and then we'll see where we go from there, and it'll be a great time, so just come. I encourage you to bring somebody, and God has some great things for us. So this week, we're going to dive into this um, not just concept, but the activity of abiding. And look at the importance of abiding. So we're going to start with John chapter 15. And I'm going to read it to you out of the Passion Translation. And we're really just going to abide in this space for the time that we have left. And then we're going to uh, abide together in some worship together in this process. So... Uh, do this for me, just, just agree with me that I will follow the Holy Spirit and not get bogged down on any one thing, but this, that we will get to what the Holy Spirit wants to emphasize today, because I have too much, too much for today. So just say, I agree. I agree. Thank you, that helps me. All right, John chapter 15 I'm going to read from the Passion Translation, and it is popping up there. Can you all read that? It's not very contrast, but um, I can read it, so trust me. Beginning with verse 1, Jesus says, I am a true spouting, sprouting, I'm a true spouting. Y'all, we can have fun, right? I am a true sprouting vine. And the farmer who tends the vine is my father. He cares for the branches connected to me by lifting and propping up the fruitless branches and pruning every fruitful branch to yield a greater harvest. The words I have spoken over you have already cleansed you. So you must remain in life union or, King James says, abide in me. So you must remain in life union with me. For I remain in life union or abide with you. For as a branch severed, severed from the vine will not bear fruit, so your life will be fruitless unless you live your life intimately joined to mine. Don't you love the Passion Translation? Uh, I just love I, I, I want to just stop and say, Brian Simmons, who's the translator, who's writing the Passion Translating, he was a translator to, an in, to a tribe, an Indian tribe in Mexico, in Central America. I just love how he has captured the heart of the Father in his translation. So, with that in mind, 
I am, I am, verse 5, I am the sprouting vine and you're my branches. As you live in union with me as your source, fruitfulness will stream from within you. But when you live separated from me, you are powerless. What a beautiful picture. If a person is separated from me, he is discarded. Many scholars say he identified that specifically speaking about Judas. Because he's in the room on the night before his crucifixion at the Last Supper with his disciples. So he's specifically identifying that even in this group of friends, there's one person that's li- that is separate. And he's identifying that. So, if a person is separated from me, he is discarded. Such branches are gathered up and thrown into the fire to be burned. But if you live in life union with me and my words, specifically Rama there, If my words live powerfully within you, then you can ask whatever you desire, and it will be done. When your lives bear abundant fruit, you demonstrate that you are my mature disciples who glorify my Father. Now, let me give you just a little bit of context. As I said, this is the night of the Last Supper. It's the night he is betrayed. It's the night before his crucifixion. He's with his disciples in a room. And and John captures from chapter uh, 13 through chapter, uh, I think it's 19, 18. He, He captures the discussion. Jesus imparting his last words, imparting his heart to not only his friends, but also to the leaders of the church that will go forward outside of his physical presence. So he is about to depart them, and uh, and he is about to depart them, and he is imparting to them before he departs. And so that's why numerous times in that passage, in that discourse, he says, I am sending you another comforter. In other words, the Holy Spirit, he will be with you in the same way I'm with you. I'm not leaving you comfortless. I'm not leaving you as orphans, but I am sending another comforter, one just like me who will be in you and he will be with you. So he's encouraging them and strengthening them for what's to come. It's very similar to Joshua chapter 1. I'm going to link a couple of passages together here for you. Um, because I think there's some real connection that can unfold some truth for us. So Joshua chapter 1, you'll remember, Moses is dead. It opens up in Joshua chapter 1, verse 1. Moses, my servant, is dead. How's that for an opening? Right? But then he goes on to say, As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. Take the people into the promised land. As I promised Moses, I'm now putting this assignment on you and you will lead them in. And I will be with you even as I was with Moses. Be strong and courageous. Be strong and courageous. Three times he tells Joshua, be strong and courageous. And then he tells Joshua how to do that how to be strong and courageous, and, and, well, let's just take take a look at that. Joshua chapter 1, verse 7, he says, Above all, be strong and courageous. Be careful to observe all the law that my servant Moses commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left so that you may prosper wherever you go. This book of the law must not depart from your mouth, Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it for then you, turn to your neighbor and say you, then you will prosper and succeed in all you do. 
So he's telling Joshua, be strong and courageous. Be strong and courageous. As I was with Moses, I will be with you. Be strong and courageous. And here's how to do that. Meditate. Here's how to grow strength and courage in your inner life. Meditate on the Word. And I think in, in our contemporary culture and church, we hear the, the word the law as a real negative. Like avoid the law. We're free from the law. I understand. In the context, what he's saying, replace the word the law. The word there is actually the Torah, which did refer to the first five books of, uh, of the Bible that Moses had just written. But they didn't know it as a negative, the law. They knew it as instruction. Remember when Moses prayed in Exodus 33, Lord, teach me your ways and show me your glory? Yes, thank you. (laughs) Just checking. He said, teach me your ways and show me your glory. I think in, in America, in contemporary church in America, because that's where I live, so that's what I know. The contemporary American church has really focused on show me your glory, show me your glory, show me your glory. We want to see your glory. Yes and amen. So true. We want the glory. But can I say, and can or can you hear me when I say, Moses said, teach me your ways and show me your glory, that there is an aspect of his glory is manifest in his character and his nature, which is expressed in his ways. And when we have a heart to learn who he is, what he's like, what his nature is, and the way that he does things, then we will be more ready to receive the glory when he shows it to us. Because the glory is not about a meeting. The glory is not just about a present that wafts into the room. The glory is something that abides. He's looking not for a visitation, for a, but for a habitation. And that happens when we learn his ways, when we learn what he's like, and when we, when we learn his instructions... So when we meditate, when he's telling Joshua, meditate on the law, he's not just saying, memorize the Ten Commandments. Y'all still with me? He's saying, I want you to meditate on the truths of how I revealed myself to Moses, because I want to reveal myself to you that way, because you need to know me to do what I've called you to do. The assignment that I've called you to fulfill, to lead all of these millions of people into a promised land, is bigger than you. So you're going to have to know me. So meditate on this so that you can have insight into who I am because I ain't leaving you. You need to know you're not alone and this is not on your shoulders. So you need to know who's with you. You get in that picture. So here's the thing. Jesus is saying the same thing to the church. He's saying, I'm about to leave you. You're not going to see me. Even after I'm resurrected, I'll be with you for a little bit, but then you're not going to see me the same way you've been seeing me. Paul said it in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 14. He says, even we used to know Jesus after the flesh, but now we don't know him that way any longer. But we know, know each other after the Spirit. If any man is in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. All things have become new. So we have to know each other in the spirit. Are you all with me? So Jesus is saying the same thing to his disciples as God spoke to Joshua. He's saying, be strong, be courageous. I'm not leaving you. I'm not forsaking you because the Holy Spirit's going to be given to you. The Holy Spirit is in me. I'm in the Father, and you're in me, and we are one. And so I will be with you even if you don't see me, and this is what you need to do. Abide, abide, abide in me. And abiding means meditate. Meditate on who I am. 
Meditate on my word. So he says, abide in me if you abide in me and my words, my words abide in you. My rhema, the spoken words, the things I have spoken to you, the things that you have heard, and you're going to forget the things you've heard, so the Holy Spirit's going to remind you of the things you heard so that you'll remember the things you heard so that the things that I said will stay alive on the inside of you. Because that voice, not the memorized text, But that voice, the living voice, is going to give you the courage you need to face the opposition, the persecution, all the things that are about to come upon you. So you need to recognize the voice. And that happens by abiding. So how many of you think it might be important that we learn to abide? So let me give you one more context because who's he speaking to again? He's speaking to his disciples, right? Who are his disciples? They are Hebrews. They are Jewish. They are Israelite, right? So they grew up in synagogue, whether they liked it or not. They grew up hearing the stories they grew up hearing the, the reading of the prophets. They grew up hearing the reading of the law. They grew up hearing Isaiah chapter 27. They grew up hearing many, many times in the, in the, in the prophets, uh, the prophets talking about Israel as a nation being God's vineyard. And in Isaiah chapter 27, there's specific Isaiah talks about the vineyard of God. So he's not talking in, into a vacuum. You get what I'm saying? He's talking into a context and an understanding that they, they knew. It was familiar to them that we as Israelites are the vineyard of God. He takes care of us. He, he is our caretaker. And we, I mean, in, be honest here, they're like, we are his vineyard. No other nation is the vineyard. We are the vineyard. We produce the best wine, right? I'm being a little silly, but you get my, pick, my, my point. They're really full of pride as a nation. So much so, apart from the disciples, they didn't recognize who Jesus was. So Jesus is saying to them, I am the vine. Okay, so let me just, I'm, I'm giving you a lot of context today. Just go with me and then we'll go boom at the end. So, so understand this. Jesus is saying, when he says, I am the vine. It's the seventh and last I am statement Jesus made in the gospel. That's a whole separate study worth taking the, uh, the seven I am statements that Jesus made. Today, we're just recognizing this is the seventh and the last. It's significant. Here's why it's significant. He says, I am the vine... What he just declared is the law is no longer the vine. He just turned the tables on what is the authority of the kingdom of God. He just said Israel, the Pharisees, the temple is no longer your source. It's no longer the vine. I am the vine. So when he says, you abide in me and let my words abide in you, I believe he's referring back to, in their understanding and their experience, the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5, when he made statements, numerous statements, you've heard it said, but I say unto you. 
You heard it said, but I say unto you. You heard it said, and he quotes the law, but I say unto you. Are you getting me? A new commandment I give you. He is absolutely reorienting their whole life. Who knows if they got it at that moment? I don't know. But John apparently got it at some time before he wrote it down. I believe if no, one, if no other time, after the Holy Spirit was poured out, they all kind of went, oh. <laughs> now I know what he's talking about. Right? So, so Jesus is completely redefining their reality. That no longer are they significant because they were born Jews. Now they're significant because they're connected to the vine of who Jesus is. And his words are taking root in their heart and changing the way they think. Changing, redefining who God is. Redefining his character and nature. They're actually getting a better picture of what the nation of Israel thought the character of God was. Are you with me? Do you remember that in Exodus chapter 33, Moses, when he asked to, to, to said, Lord, teach me your way, show me your glory, and the Lord actually passed before him. Remember all that? Okay. If not, please go read that. So, but not now. When you get home. You got something to do all week. It said, the Lord passed by and declared his name, the Lord good and compassionate, forgiving, who doesn't overlook sin, but holds those accountable to the second and third generation, but forgiving. It's like the nation of Israel lopped off the first three statements of that and focused on the condemning statement. Much of what the church still does today. Listen, there is justice against sin. There is the issue of justice. But the goodness of God is this. His nature is so good that he took the justice on himself. And went to the cross and paid the price for our injustices. Are y'all with me? You're beginning to see this. Jesus, by making an I am statement, is really blowing their brain by the contrast of who it, it, redefining who God is. He's been doing it all of his ministry for three and a half years. But now he's at that moment. He's directly confronting them and says, I I, I am the vine. You are the branches. Connect to me. Get your definition. Later in Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews, probably Paul, but the writer of Hebrews says he is the exact representation, the, the exact image of the Father. Not particularly what everybody been teaching, but he is. The exact image. That's why we say Jesus is perfect theology. So for instance, y'all just, if you've not asked yourself this question, ask it now. Did Jesus ever make anybody sick? He only healed. So where, and I don't, this is a rhetorical question, I don't want anybody, any answers about where, but where? Did we ever get the idea that God will make you sick to teach you something? It didn't come from Jesus. That doesn't mean he won't use anything, and that doesn't mean we, got, we don't have a whole lot to learn in the process. But just because he didn't author it doesn't mean he can't use it. But in order to comfort ourselves with a false comfort, we will adopt a lie that says God caused it. And that assigns evil character to a good God. 
I'm just saying. So, a lot of context. Praise the Lord. So follow with me to Isaiah chapter 27. This is what they would have been. They would have been familiar with this passage and certainly the idea. The picture of Israel as God's vineyard. Isaiah 27 verse 1 through 3. So listen to this closely. In that day, Isaiah's prophesying about a day yet to come. In that day, the Lord will take his sharp, great, and mighty sword and bring judgment on Leviathan, the fleeing serpent, Leviathan, the coiling serpent, and he will slay the dragon of the sea. In that day, sing about a fruitful vineyard. I, the Lord, am its keeper. I water it continually. I guard it night and day so no one can disturb it. Most of Israel's perception would have been that that's going to that's a political prophecy. And it had a political application about the return of exiles to build the second temple. Temple. But can you see he's Isaiah speaking bigger than just politically. He's speaking about a day that day when the Lord will take his great and mighty sword. Hello. Remember Revelation talking about the sword that comes out of his mouth? Remember that Hebrews talks about the double-edged sword of the word? What is the sword? Jesus the Messiah is the sword. Remember in John chapter 12 when, when it says that when Jesus said, When I be lifted up, I'll draw all men unto me. He goes on to say, Now is the judgment of the prince of this world. In that day, what day? The day of Jesus, the day of his crucifixion, the mighty sword of the Messiah is bringing judgment on Leviathan, on Satan, on the opposer against God's people and bringing him down and there will come a release of fruitfulness in the vineyard of God and the vineyard of God, wait for it, isn't national Israel the vineyard of God is the people of God who are the branches who abide in the vine which is Jesus, it's the church of Jesus Christ so today the church is enforcing and implementing that same judgment. John said it again in his letter, 1 John chapter 3, verse 8. said, for this purpose, the Son of God came into the earth to destroy the works of the devil. Judgment isn't a future reality, it's a past reality, and it is a present reality when we enforce that judgment against the works of the devil through the word, through the sword of the word, we are enforcing that same judgment on demonic forces in the heavenly realm. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. If you only knew how powerful you are abiding in the vine. So Jesus is saying, I am the vine. Abide in me and you'll produce fruit. The fruit is the destruction of the enemy's work. Fruit is ask. Whatever you ask, it'll be done. Whatever you desire will be done of my Father. 
that my Father may be glorified. The fruit of us abiding in the vine is answered prayer and the glorification of the Father in the earth. Please understand, we're, we're, we sang and we're about to sing again and our worship team's coming now, a third of the way through my message. We sing, come again. When we sing, come again, we're not talking, please don't just be talking about a future second coming yes that is coming yes the fullness of the kingdom will come the kingdom is here but not fully yet in the meantime we're not even just saying come again like he's not here unless I feel him he is here he is here and he is here But our crying out for come again is that we are crying, really, we, we're the ones that are coming again. We're the ones that are drilling into the vine. We're the ones that are pressing in to him for the reality of the life that's in the vine to flow into us of the branches. We're, if, if you want to sing come again, say it this way. There's a vine on the inside of me and there is life-giving words in the realm of the Spirit that are the words of Jesus, the words of God that are filled with life. Jesus said in John 6, 63, my words are life. They are, they are life. So say, come on. Like singing to that spring up. Remember the old song in the 80s, spring up a well? up oh well this is this is the 2020 version of spring up oh well come again come on well come on spirit man come up I need the life of God the words of God to come again to my consciousness I need strength I need courage and that may mean that I go back to the word it may mean I, I, I want to encourage some of you this week if you need courage, go back to Joshua chapter 1, but, but read it out loud over yourself this way. God spoke to Joshua and said, As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. Hebrews tells us this. There is one more, a servant more faithful than Moses. And that's Jesus. So read it as Jesus is speaking to you. Or God the Father speaking to you, saying, as I was with Jesus, so I will be with you. Be strong. Be of good courage. As I was with Jesus, so I am with you. When he raised the dead, I was with him. And so I am with you. When he opened blind eyes, I was with him. And so I am with you. When he fed the 5,000, I was with him. And so I am with you. As I was with Jesus, so I am with you. So I'm in you. So be strong. Stand with me. Be of good courage. Meditate, abide, press in to the words of Jesus. And let that begin to spring up on the inside. Let me say, as we do that, let me quote a song. This is how I do my bath. This is how I walk. Let me be so bold as to say there's, please understand, there's times to rebuke the devil, P 
Peter said, resist the devil, he will flee. But can, can you hear me when I say our greatest power is not in the volume of our rebuke. There's greater authority in our life when we abide in the vine. then we don't have to struggle and wrestle. We're not, I, 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 I'll just be transparent. It really gets me when Christians are preoccupied with what the devil's doing. If you come to me and tell me everything the devil's doing in your life, please forgive me. If I want to slap you, I won't. Because the problem's really not the devil. He may be harassing. He is real. There are real demonic harassing. But here's the here's here's the gift we've been given as we live in this world where there is a prince of the power of the air, but he's already judged. The gift we've been given is not, not just to ignore him, not to deny him, but to abide in the vine. So we're not intimidated by him. Most of spiritual warfare, I believe, most, most spiritual warfare, I believe, is birthed out of fear, not out of faith. We're trying to overcome it in our own emotions. Because we're so afraid. You know, we, he's already got us on our back heels. When you press into the vine, when you press into the words of Jesus and you become intimate with him and your consciousness is filled with his, with his love, his presence, his authority and the reality that he's already defeated the enemy and there's no weapon formed against me can prosper because my righteousness is of the Lord. It's not my own righteousness. It's his righteousness as a free gift. I can stand here and worship and this is how I fight my battles. And the enemy cannot gainsay or overcome the reality of the cross and what it's worked in me. So warfare is not an activity. It's the manifestation of a reality. Huh. So all of that being said, if you're here today, if you're online, if you're watching online, one of the descriptions of G that Jesus said in John chapter 15, he said, if there are branches who are separated, they've been, they've been lopped off, they dried up, fell off, don't let that be your condition. It doesn't have to be. That's not his choice. He's saying, come again, come on, come back. Just plug back in, just reconnect. I'm right here, I'm the vine. I'll give all the life, I'll give all the nourishment, everything you need, just everything you need, just reconnect. If that's, if that's you at home, if that's you here, you just need to say, I need to reconnect to the vine. I need to reconnect to Jesus. I just want you to wave at it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. He welcomes. He welcomes. So I want us to pray this prayer. If you're, a, if you're watching online at home, I just want you to type in whichever YouTube or Facebook chat you're on and just say, pray for me. I need to reconnect one of our team will follow up with you. Pray this with me, Heavenly Father. All together, Heavenly Father. 
I return to you. I reconnect to Jesus, my vine. I let go of my own life, of my own efforts, and I declare today, I need your life. Forgive me. Cleanse me through your words and reconnect me to the life of the Father through relationship with the Son. I thank you now. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let's give them all a big hand. Let's welcome them. Hallelujah. Reconnected. And then let's take this moment and let's open our hearts, not, not just from not expecting heaven to come down, but expecting heaven to come up. To flow from our innermost being like rivers of living water. His life, just declaring, come again. And let's lift our voice and connect and abide in the vine before we go. really 
really sense, like, y'all are into this. No one left. And I just declare, we're, you know, we're moving in this sermon series on abiding, but I really believe it's not just a sermon series. I believe as a church right now, there's something settling in on us that's going to recalibrate our lives around the presence. And so as we were singing that, what I sensed was people just are going, I want more of this. And I'm so glad we have a worship night next Sunday night. And we'll be doing other things at that worship night. But one of the reasons we do that is to give like extended times for just what's going on here and now. So I just want to encourage you to attach your faith to the next few weeks. And uh, anything God does for one of us, he's doing for all of us. And I myself, Paul said, he said, uh, next week's Cliff is sharing on abiding. After that, Pastor Tab is sharing on abiding. And then he said, we'll see where we go from there. And I was sitting right there going, "Uh uh-uh, I'm next. Because honestly, this is... This is burning in us. And I don't know in 30 years of pastoral ministry if I've ever felt more connection between the platform and the people, not that there's a separation. Arcing. Arcing. I do mean that. Thank you. Thank you. Are you going to share about that? I, I did preach on that. But you reminded me of it. It's so great to have people that came up in your ministry because they, like, remind you of stuff. When she said that, I was like... That needs to be in the sermon. That was good. So anyway, feel free to run with that even farther. Um, Y'all, something special is going on. And I just want to declare over you, over every one of you, you're so welcome. Even if we haven't met you yet, come meet us. But I'm not saying that's going to change your world. But we'll start something. Um, And if you're watching online, if you're connecting in any way, I just really believe there's a taproot or a just a vine life flow. And I really believe we're going to be refreshed in our spirits about how great Christianity is. It's the greatest offer on earth. It's the greatest thing in all the universe. But we have just had a lot assault us for life and stuff. And I believe as a church, there is a corporate download of newness and abiding, and I think you're sensing that. So we're going to dismiss for now, but I just want to say we're connected, and you are not alone this week as you go out. And next week, next Sunday, worship night, the future, we're invested. How about you? I'm excited. And we, Lord, we just release our expectancy to you, and we just declare once again everything that song said. Lord, nothing hinders the vine life, the life union, the thing you have done in Christ. The cross has already cut through every hindrance. So we receive your abiding life. Teach us this week what that looks like in day to day. Amen. Amen. We love you. We will see you next week and talk to you at any time we can. Come again, let your glory in. I am open, I am open. Come again, come again, let your glory in. much for joining the Abbey service today. We are so thankful for you and we pray that this message blessed you this week. Don't stop here. Stay connected with us by liking us on Facebook and subscribing to our YouTube channel. Please see below for additional ways to receive updates and news as well as stay engaged with our Abbey community. You can also support the Abbey through giving on any of our platforms. We are grateful for your continued giving to help us reach people around the world and grow the kingdom through local and international missions. 
Thank you again for watching. We love you and God bless.